Hello, welcome back to my channel. So, today I am from Texas. I don't know why I just did that. <laughs> so, long, long ago, during the days of flower crowns, uh, the weird obsession we had with mustaches in Britain, and during the peak of Super Hulock, there was this app called Wattpad. Wattpad was a place to read and write anything you desired, and it had a chokehold on teenage girls in the 2010s myself included. One of the largest fanfictions on Wattpad was this fanfiction called After, written by Anna Todd, a fellow Texan. <laughs> Really, we're doing really well in the representation department. After is about a sheltered girl going to college for the first time where she meets One Direction and falls for Harry Styles, who in the story is like the school's bad boy, player, cheater, and honestly shitty dude. And the whole book and its two sequels is just the main character Tessa's toxic and overly sexual relationship with Harry Styles. This fan fiction currently has almost 700 million reads and the sequel has a little bit over 530 and the third one has a little bit over 780 million reads why am i not in focus okay maybe that fixed it i don't know the series was so big that it ended up getting published as an actual five book series similar to how 50 shades of gray started as a twilight fan fiction and just like 50 shades the names of the characters were changed because Obviously, you can't really publish a book about an abusive relationship with Harry Styles and then use Harry Styles' name and livelihood. And then, those books became so popular that they got their own movies, thanks to Netflix and Wattpad Studios. Yes, Wattpad has their own film production section now. There are currently three movies in the After Saga, with the fourth one coming out later this year, and two other movies that have already been greenlit, so they're coming soon. There's a rumor that Harry Styles actually has a restraining order against the author Anna Todd. I don't think that's true. I've not seen any evidence for it. No sites have confirmed it, and Harry has not ever made a public comment about the whole ordeal, so safe to say that's not true. Anyways, today I'm going to be watching the first three movies for the first time, and you're gonna do it with me, or you're gonna watch me do it. <laughs> Let's begin starting with, obviously, the first movie, which is just titled After. So, the story begins with sheltered good girl Hannah Young starting her first year of university at the Rossmore College in Atlanta or Rossmore University of Atlanta, something like that. I know it's Rossmore and I know it's in Atlanta. She has the goal of becoming an economics major, but she secretly has more of a passion for writing and being a novelist. Steph is her roommate and she's the polar opposite of Tessa and is also the ridiculously hyperbolic version of like the bad girl. Uh, she laughs at Tessa's boyfriend when he says his sweater is from the Gap. She vapes and she and her friends say that they can get Tessa into all the good places without even needing a fake ID right in front of Tessa's mom, who, fun fact, is actually played by Selma Blair. Hey, queen. So anyway, that obviously upsets her mom, and she's clearly meant to be portrayed as, like, this overbearing, overprotective buzzkill of a parent, but, like, no, I think she reacted completely appropriately to hearing these two older girls telling her freshly out of the nest daughter that they're gonna guide her into the life of, like, underage drinking and drug use right in front of her mom. Like, obviously you're gonna try new things, maybe some not so legal activities when you get the freedom that comes with moving out of your parents' house. And there's nothing wrong with that. It'd be hypocritical of me to condemn that. Steph and her friend offering to help Tessa out in the college social life area isn't bad or weird. I'm just so stuck on the fact that they said it right in front of Tessa's mom. Like, the writing of these characters is so cartoonish. The writers had to have been like, how do we show that this girl's a bit rebellious within the first 30 seconds of her introduction? Speaking of cartoonish characters, oh my god, the lack of depth is astounding. We are ankle deep in a kiddie pool with the amount of depth we have with these characters so far, okay? It's like the writers didn't trust that the watcher of the movie would be smart enough to pick up a character's personality traits just like naturally through watching the story develop. So they did the equivalent of taking those like, hello, my name is stickers and then filling in the blank with like a stereotypical character trope and slapping it on uh, every character. So you don't have to use your brain. 
brain to figure out who they are, you know? So we have Tessa, right? The sheltered girl ready to take on the world and experience new things, but she's very inexperienced and has trouble getting over her modesty. How do we show that her roommate is the opposite of that? We make sure Tessa is the physical embodiment of innocence. So she enters the movie wearing this frilly white shirt. She's blonde. She's got blue eyes. She brings her books and her stereotypically dorky boyfriend to her dorm. And then we can have Steph have, you know, piercings and hair dye and a jewel. <laughs> and also make fun of Tessa's books and dorky boyfriend. That's good, but I don't know. That might be too subtle. I mean, how are they going to know the boyfriend's a dork? We we can make him shop at the Gap. Good God, anyway. Honestly, the dialogue of this movie frustrates me. Sorry, I know I'm back to this, but literally the costume design of this movie is actually pretty good. I really wish they had just trusted the costume team to like classify the characters. Like Tessa's first day outfit is purposely overly modest and out of trend as much of her wardrobe is, whereas Steph is very on trend and has no problem, you know, showing some shoulder. And the clothes speak for themselves. I, I really like looking at the clothes that everyone's wearing. So after her first day of classes ends, Tessa takes a well-deserved hot shower, and when she gets back to her room, Harry Sta- Harden Scott, sorry, Harden Scott, is already in there alone, reading The Great Gatsby, because he needs you to know that he's an intellectual. And when Tessa makes it clear she doesn't want this whole-ass man that she doesn't know to be in her room while she's trying to change, he intentionally doesn't oblige her request, and he goes even further and twists it into this thing of, like, what, you think I'm looking at- sorry, the British accent- what, you think I'm looking at you? You wish. I'm just reading my novel. <laughs> and he doesn't leave. I feel like if that's not illegal, it should be. <laughs> so yes, this is Hardin, the bad boy who's for some reason British, despite this movie taking place in Georgia, even though the other One Direction characters in this movie aren't British. Hardin and Steph try to peer pressure Tessa to join them at a frat party, but she refuses. But the next day she's studying at some cafe or like college dining hall when Hardin and Steph and the guy that's supposed to be Zayn Malik come in and she and Hardin make eye contact and this quaint little music plays and it's supposed to be like sparks are flying, even though the one single interaction they had before this was like borderline <laughs> sexual harassment. Anyways, nothing else really happens, so flash forward to where the actual plot starts, which is naturally 15 minutes into the movie. Steph convinces Tessa to go to her first ever college party, to which she naturally wears what I wore to my first middle school dance. I will say, I know I'm dragging Tessa's outfit choices so far, but I actually think it's really clever the way they've dressed her in the way that it's super outdated and modest, but what Tessa wears are clothes that would have been very popular when the fan fiction was written in like 2013. It makes sense that Tessa is wearing that dress to the frat party because this is probably what someone would have used in their like frat date with Harry Styles, Polyvore post. Y'all remember Polyvore? Shout out Polyvore. I ate that shit up in seventh grade. Anyways, at the party we meet the biggest bitch on the planet, bitch ass Molly. I know I've complained about how the characters are written as stereotypical tropes. I'm giving Molly a pass for her two-dimensionalness because of how good of a job they did at making me hate her. She, oh my god, this girl is evil. Literally two seconds after meeting Tessa, she's already making fun of her outfit and her lack of sexual experiences. She's so mean for no reason. So anyways, this is where the actual point of contention starts because unbeknownst to Tessa, and also unbeknownst to us until later on in the movie, but whatever, Hardin makes a bet with his group of friends that he will be able to make Tessa fall for him. And once he's done that, he's just gonna break her heart. And this is where the actual romance between them starts. Uh, Tessa snoops around in Hardin's room, and then when Hardin finds her, they share what's supposed to be like this cute bonding moment over literature, but Hardin just belittles her and calls her by the wrong name, and Tessa, for the second time that night, refuses to kiss him. These people are meant to be our end game. <laughs> Flash forward a bit, it turns out that Tessa and Hardin are in the same literature class, where Tessa and Hardin yet again argue about books, and oh, shocking, Hardin is a raging misogynist and also not as smart as he thinks he is. And he also isn't even charming enough to be acting like this. Like, he walks out of that class so smug and happy with himself for getting under Tessa's skin, but like, so far you have zero redeeming qualities that would allow you to act like this, okay? Take a fucking seat, sir. And as a fan fiction reader, yeah, at my big embarrassing age, I'm not even like against enemies to lovers or like making the love interest not enjoyable at first, but I think things like that work better in written form because it allows the reader to hear the main character's inner dialogue about the love interest. So we can see the main character thinking things like, oh, I just wish he wasn't so attractive or like, 
he's so annoying, but why do I find him so hot? You know, stuff like that. But we don't have that here. We just have Tessa and Harden arguing. And when they aren't, we have Tessa complaining about Harden to her friend Landon. There's no chemistry. Also, Landon is supposed to be Liam Payne. Oh, but speaking of him, though, he is soon to be the stepbrother of Harden because his mom is dating Harden's dad, Chancellor Scott. That's important. So you know how I just said that these two don't have chemistry? Don't, no, don't worry. They still don't. But Tessa has, despite just telling Harden that she doesn't want to be friends with him, agreed to go out in the middle of some random woods with him and skinny dip together. <laughs> A very unforced and totally natural connection is forming. They kiss, obviously, and then we have the first instance of Harden actually being a decent person. There's this moment where they're on the pier of the lake that they were swimming in, and Harden's trying to do things with his hand that I don't think I can, like, verbalize without getting demonetized. But when Tessa is like, hey, never done this before, Harden decides to not do it. So, you know, congrats, we've reached the bare minimum. <laughs> so after that, they are eating dinner together at some diner and bitch ass Molly and great value Zayn Malik crash their little dinner date. Don't worry though, we didn't gain anything from this interaction other than learning another level of Harden's pretentiousness. He doesn't like asking or being asked questions while on a date because he thinks that they're arbitrary and the real way to get to know someone is by spending time with them. Which, while not technically untrue, Tessa was just trying to ask him things like, what are you, what are you going to college for? What, what's your family like? Both of which aren't arbitrary. It's completely normal to want basic knowledge of someone that you're on a date with. So after they get their date crashed, Harden then tells Tessa he doesn't date even though Again, they are on a date. <laughs> Not to mention that's also completely going against his secret dare of making Tessa fall for him, but you know, whatever. This upsets Tessa, so we get a montage of her going through a glow up and trying makeup and going through her clothes to find something that doesn't look like it belongs to a youth pastor's wife. Um, and while she's doing this, an unyossified version of... <laughs> And while she's doing this, an unyossified version of Complicated by Avril Lavigne plays. Yeah. Cut to the next day. Uh-oh, Tessa's boyfriend Noah surprises her with a visit at the college. Drama. Tessa then thinks it's a good idea to take said boyfriend to a bonfire party where Harden and bitch-ass Molly and the whole gaggle of friends are. They play suck and blow in what I can only assume is a poor homage to Clueless, and the creepy friend Jace drops the card on purpose to try and kiss Tessa. This upsets Harden, even though he said he doesn't date, and as any rational person does, tries to fist fight him. For the context of the scene, or I guess the content of the scene, it was weirdly short and anticlimactic, so I'm moving on from it. Later that night, Tessa gets a call from Landon, remember, because he and Harden are soon to be stepbrothers, and he asks her to come over, and when she does, Landon's basically like, hey, can you get Harden, like, into check? He's in some drunken rampage right now, and he trashed our house, and I don't really want to deal with it. I'd almost feel bad for Tessa at how seemingly everyone in her life walks over her, but also she kind of allows herself to get walked over, so I can only feel so bad. Like, when she confronts Harden, when Landon asks her to, Harden's being a total asshole and smashes a glass at her feet and she tries to clean it for him and she like cuts her hand tessa stand up <laughs> love yourself please tessa cuts her finger on the broken glass which leads to a tender moment between tessa and harden where he helps her clean up the wound and apologizes for the way he acted and then they kiss at least it's supposed to be a tender moment but it's quite literally just the beginning behaviors to a cycle of emotional abuse so that's this is great. Oh shit, the next day, Tessa's boyfriend figures out what's going on because she literally left him in the middle of the night to go see Harden. And when she gets back, Noah's like, hey, what the fuck? And then Harden, Harden just comes out from behind a tree. <laughs> so Tessa and Noah break up over this as they should. She cheated. Uh, she doesn't really seem to stay sad about it for very long. After a short montage of Tessa looking off in the distance with a slightly sad expression, she goes right back to Harden. Another montage ensues. This one is of Tessa and Harden acting cute and coupley. This montage is naturally much shorter than the one of Tessa being sad at her and Noah breaking up, as if that breakup wasn't completely her fault, because again, she cheated on him. We get another scene of the writers trying to make Selma Blair look like a bitch because she caught Tessa cutting class with Harden and isn't happy that Tessa 
Tessa is cutting the classes that Selma Blair pays for to hang out with a boy. And Tessa chooses Hardin over her mom and is now completely cut off from her family. It's giving Cassie from Euphoria. <laughs> so you might be wondering what Tessa's gonna do now that she doesn't have, you know, the money to pay for her dorm or classes. Don't worry though, Hardin for some reason has access to an apartment that belongs to a friend of his father, and he and Tessa are basically like, oh, okay, this is ours now, because the owner's like in Italy for work or something. Wait, how much time has passed? What the fuck? They're literally just living together now. It can't be more than like a month or two since the frat party, right? <laughs> What the fuck? Okay, the scene of Tessa and Hardin at the aquarium where they're in front of like the giant tank is actually really beautiful. It's the first time they've had a moment where I was like, okay, that's cute. So kudos to that. Skipping forward a little bit, we are now like 20 minutes until the end of the movie. Hardin's phone is blowing up and Tessa reads the messages. They are from Steph and Molly and they mention not telling her yet. And Tessa's like, hey what's going on? <laughs> and Hardin leaves after basically telling Tessa to fuck off. Tessa is moping around in their stolen shared apartment when she gets a text from their creepy friend Jace. Jace and Tessa meet up and Jace tells Tessa that Hardin is at the diner that they had the dinner at that one time after the lake. Tessa then goes to said diner to confront Hardin but instead finds Steph, Molly, and knockoff Zane Malik first. Jace and Hardin then get to the table when Molly exposes the dare that she had with Hardin. To be fair, that actually is a pretty decent scene. The way Tessa reacts almost like puts you on edge because she's like stunned and not moving and you don't really know what she's gonna do next. So good on like the anticipation factor. Tessa and Hardin break up. That's, that's what happens next. Tessa decides to go home and see her mom and apologize to her. The mom apologizes back for what it's worth. It's a sweet scene. Tessa then decides to try and make amends with her ex-boyfriend Noah for what it's worth. That is also a sweet scene, though Noah's a bigger person than me because I wouldn't have been that forgiving. So now Tessa is moving on and finally doing things for herself and trying to get over Hardin. She's applied for an internship at a publishing firm and lands an interview. All the while, Hardin is just being Mr. Struggle, which is kind of deserved. The movie ends with the professor of Tessa and Hardin's shared class breaking university rules of academic integrity by giving Tessa Hardin's final exam essay because she thought it was written for Tessa. Long story short, the essay is actually a letter to Tessa and he's talking about love and basically writing a call to action to Tessa of like, if you love me and you're willing to forgive me, come to the place where I almost fingered you that one time. Love you. And the movie ends with them meeting at the pier and they share a silent stare of like a, what now? And then the movie ends. <laughs> that is the first movie in the after saga. Um, some thoughts before we move on to the sequel. Part of me wants to be forgiving because I'm like, eh, I'm an adult and I'm like not even really a fan of Harry Styles. I don't think I'm the target demographic for this. But then I think, I kind of am though. I think this movie was made for the group of people that read the fan fiction as it was coming out and like no one else <laughs> because that honestly makes more sense. It's a teen movie but it's not really a teen movie because it's like about college and there's sex and drinking and stuff. I think it's for teens that were teens during the Wattpad era but now they aren't teens anymore but Netflix knows that the teen girl inside that now adult woman is gonna have their curiosity get the best of them and still watch the movie. Because I know Netflix is weird but I don't think they're weird enough to market a movie with such adult themes to like actual teenagers. Actually, I don't know, I wouldn't put it past them. Anyways, I don't have too much else to say. It wasn't great obviously but I think in terms of like older teen slash young adult romance dramas, it was on par in terms of quality, I think. I will say the pacing was a bit weird and it was very hard to tell how much time had passed on through the movie. Not that it's that important and I wouldn't really expect them to put like a two weeks later, it is now September 17th as like a cutscene or anything like that. But I think it makes for poor world building when the audience can't tell when something has happened or for how long it's happened. It's implied that this all happened within the span of one college semester, as we can tell by the last 15-ish minutes of the movie when Tessa is given Hardin's letter that he submitted for his final exam essay. At the start of that scene, the professor says, for this semester, and it could have been a course that requires you to take two semesters of it to get the credit, but I don't think that's the case considering we never see any holiday scenes. Wait, Ho but hold on. <laughs> this is Tessa's first semester of college, which is typically late August to like early December. My college classes ended around the first week to week and a half of December. 
Why didn't we see Thanksgiving at all? Did she start college during the spring semester? Wait, that would actually kind of make sense because something I was going to bring up is the fact that if this was the fall semester, the costume design should have changed with the season and we don't really see a change at all. People are still dressing like it's warm, even though the average high temperature in Atlanta where this takes place in December is like mid to low 50s, which if you're not American, that's like 10 degrees Celsius. I'm right. I'm right. This is wrong. The movie costuming y'all fucked it up world building no okay i went to the last chapter of after and it says here christmas is only three weeks away and they're talking about how fucking cold it is she needs to get some fuzzy purple socks that her mother got her for christmas last year christmas is only three weeks away so now why are they in this movie wearing short sleeves and why am I so worked up about it? Okay, another thing. I know I have like three clips of photo booth me in a row, but I'm watching the second movie right now and I'm taking notes for this video. And and in this scene, Landon says that Tessa shares a birthday with Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin's birthday is December 18th, but the sequel starts a month after the end of the first movie. So that means that their college semester would have ended before Thanksgiving. So that just doesn't even make fucking sense. What kind of, what kind of schedule is Emory University on? I don't think that they're on a weird schedule. I think the movie is weird. I don't know, kind of weird that costuming fumbled the bag in terms of weather accuracy because I actually really liked the costuming of the movie. I thought that it was like a subtle but clever and artistic way to paint the picture of who these characters are. I know that that's not all costuming's fault though, like they, like it would have been weird to put Tessa in like a sweater and a scarf if the scene was set to where it looks like a warm sunny day. It just goes to show that the overall care they put into the world building and creating an atmosphere that's both realistic and easy to follow was not much, not much care, non-existent care. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Are we ready to move on to the sequel? Are you ready to move on to the sequel? The next movie is called After We Collided. It's almost the exact same runtime as the first movie. It's just one minute shorter, so grab a drink or a snack and let's get started. The movie opens up with a recap of what happened in the first movie, which is narrated by Harden. My favorite part is... <laughs> My favorite part is when he mentioned how hard it was for him when Tessa found out that their entire relationship was built on a lie. Of course it was, Harden, of course it was. And then the narration ends with the way after one ended, with the two of them sitting on that pier. But plot twist! It's revealed that Tessa never actually showed up. That was actually a good bait and switch. I liked that. The actual story of this movie is set to take place one month after he waited for her at the pier and Hardin is going through it. He's sleeping in his car in weird parts of town. He's being mean to the homeless. His texts to Tessa are being ignored. Meanwhile, Tessa thriving. Good for her. She got the internship at the publishing firm. It's her first day on the job and she meets a new character. Dylan Sprouse. Yes, he's in this, and honestly, he's my favorite character. I don't know what they put in that elevator scene where his character Trevor is introduced, but I was laughing my fucking ass off. Dylan's inflections and expressions in response to Tessa calling him an asswipe were so funny to me for no reason. I think it's because of how robotic Dylan is, and that's not an insult, it's clear the character is supposed to be like that, but it's just like comical. So Tessa is killing it at work, again, Good for her. She's totally cleaned and reorganized her office, and she read three full manuscripts, since her job as an intern is to read like five per week or something, and whichever ones she thinks are good enough to maybe get published, she then moves moves. She then moves them up to her boss to review. So she falls asleep at work because she was, you know, working so hard. She read three full uh, books, essentially, in one night. And she wakes up to her boss in her office the next morning being like, you read three full manuscripts in one night? Come with me. And she's like, fuck, I just lost my job because I fell asleep on the job. Great. But no, she didn't lose her job. She is basically now part of the posse that her boss takes with him to work things because he is so impressed by her. Good for her. This is the good for her movie. <laughs> so in this group is her boss, Christian Vance, the lady that Tessa reports to, her name is Kimberly, um, Tessa, of course, and Dylan Sprouse. Anyways, back to Harden. He's still going through it, and he goes to get tattooed by emo Amy Schumer, and she offers... <laughs> 
She offers him alcohol before the session to ease the pain, and Hardin goes, I like the pain. <laughs> oh, I'm a Hardin anti. I cannot fucking stand this man. Back to Tessa Land, and the plot is starting to thicken. They're at this convention thing, or like a business trip, whatever. They're getting checked into their hotel, and Tessa's room isn't ready yet because they had to book it last minute. So an employee is like, hey, we upgraded her room, um... Since we had nothing available, we upgraded it to a suite that we did have available since, you know, the room you requested wasn't available. Ooh la la, I wonder what's gonna happen. Not gonna lie, when the guy was like, Mr. Matthews' room will be ready, but Mrs. Young's isn't, I 100,000% thought that they were gonna do the two people, one bed trope, and honestly, I was here for it. I love that trope. Totally have not read Star Wars fan fictions with that trope. Anyway, oh my god, and now Kimberly and Tessa, they go shopping for something for Tessa to wear since they're going to this, like, nightclub business outing. They're, it's like an elbow rubbing thing with other business people, though, but she still has to dress for the occasion. And it's like a cute little bonding moment between Tessa and her boss, but oh my god, the dress is horrible. <laughs> okay, no, it's bad. It's pretty bad. It's not horrible, but it's really bad. It'd be better if the sleeves were not three quarter and if the skirt wasn't that kind of like waterfally skirt. But the shoes, the shoes are what makes it horrible. They did her so dirty. At the club, Trevor, Tessa, and the possible business partner, Mr. Zhang, share a ridiculously large glass of sex on the beach, and Tessa gets hammered. So back in Hardenland, he decides to go to a frat party where we see the return of Tessa's old roommate, Steph, Steph's girlfriend, great value Zayn Malik, and of course, bitch ass Molly being an absolute menace. Back in Tessa land, she's having her main character moment on the dance floor. Good for her. She starts dancing and grinding up on this random guy, and then he transforms into Harden, and when he does, she starts to make out with him because she's thinking of Harden, and then when they stop making out and she realizes it's not Harden, she ditches the dude, and Drunk calls Harden to tell him how hot she is, and then hangs up on him, and then she and Dylan Sprouse leave together to go eat room service. So they're eating, like, fries and ice cream or something like that and literally dude from this one short conversation where they're both hammered it's clear that they have more chemistry than tessa and harden even when tessa spills wine all over dylan sprouse so harden goes to tessa's hotel room because he still has her location on because of course he does um and he finds what looks like the aftermath of tessa and trevor hooking up because Trevor's holding his clothes because they were wine stains, but they didn't actually hook up. It's just because they were trying to wash the wine off. But anyways, whoa, the plot thickens because Trevor and Harden know each other. Trevor recognizes Harden's voice when he's yelling and banging on the door. And then when Harden gets into the room and sees Trevor, he goes, fucking Trevor. (laughs) Fucking Trevor. Fucking Trevor. (laughs) So that's T. Anyway, Harden kicks Trevor out and then Tessa and Harden get into a fight. And Tessa tries to tell Harden that he can't control her life before having sex with him, even though they had both just established that she was very much too intoxicated, and Hardin had just gotten done accusing Trevor of trying to take advantage of her lack of sobriety. And Hardin still has sex with her, because he is such a great guy, and these two are, for some reason, still supposed to be endgame. I will say, despite this scene in particular blurring the lines in terms of consent, I do like the adult themes so far. It's realistic in terms of the portrayal of a messy situationship and just the social life of a girl in her early 20s. It shows the growth of the character since her introduction in the first movie, so I do like that. Anyways, it's the next morning. Tessa kicks him out. They get into an argument, and then Hardin goes to Landon's house to have a short conversation with him, and he's like, fuck it, I'm running away. I'm running away to London in it. The only thing we gain from this scene is another continuity error in the world building. While Harden's driving off in his car, we see a Washington license plate, but don't they live and go to school in Georgia? I think this is just an Easter egg for the fan fiction readers that know that the fan fiction took place in Seattle, but like, I don't know, just kind of muddles the atmosphere. Like, wh- why does this British guy live in Georgia and drive a car with a Washington license plate? Who is Harden? Like, how'd he get here? I guess we'll never know, because he doesn't like arbitrary questions. Whatever. We're back in Tesla land now, and I am fully, I am fully Team Dylan Sprouse right now. It's not even funny. So, okay. So let's set the scene. Tess is in her office. He comes in and he wishes her a happy holidays because like they're going to be out of office for the holidays. And also he wishes her a happy early birthday because her birthday's the next day. So 
he gets her a birthday gift, right? It is a complete cost analysis breakdown comparing the cost of her Ubers versus owning a used car. Since when they were at the club, Tessa had complained about how much she spends on Ubers to get to and from work. So not only does he give her that breakdown, he found her a used car. He went to the dealership and negotiated the terms for her. So she had a cheap ass monthly payment with $0 down. And he talked to their boss about getting the car onto the company's auto insurance policy so she wouldn't have to pay for auto insurance. Nobody has ever loved me like that. Are you fucking kidding me? Cut to Tessa driving Landon around in her new used car. And I'm back to the license plate thing because this is where we see that it's not just Harden's car with the Washington license plate. Every car has a Washington license plate. And now I'm confused because we aren't in Washington and we know we aren't in Washington because we had a scene in front of Chancellor Scott's house, which is in Atlanta. And we know that there's no way that Tessa is in Washington while Harvey is in Harvey. And we know that there's no way that Tessa's in Washington while Harden is in Georgia because of the fact that the movie shows Harden showing up to Tessa's hotel room maybe an hour after he and Tessa had that phone call. Even though if you travel by plane from Atlanta to Seattle, that's like a four and a half hour flight. And we know that we live in Georgia because they go to the University of Atlanta. Well, I, okay. <sighs> Anyway, Tessa decides to go back to the apartment that her and Hardin essentially stole from that lady. They still have it. Hardin just lives there now. She's snooping around and she finds the gift that Hardin got her for her birthday, a Kindle. <laughs> Cute thought, don't get me wrong, but like, Dylan Sprouse got her a car. She's so choked up about that Kindle though, when, uh-oh, Hardin's home. Even though, wait, isn't he supposed to be in London? How much time has passed between him telling Landon he was leaving versus now? Because scene-wise, like, that was only five and a half minutes ago. Time simply doesn't exist in the after cinematic universe. So Hardin's talking out loud and he's like, I could run you a bath if you'd like to get more comfortable. And then a girl's voice responds, I'd love that. I remember when we used to take baths together. And it's clearly supposed to be a mystery direct to make you think Harden brought some girl home, but like, it's very obvious it's his mom. It's a more mature voice of an English woman, and Harden literally does not have friends or family that he likes to be around because he's insufferable, and the only person he genuinely likes other than Tessa is his mom. Who the fuck else would it have been? But Tessa is just no talk, all action. She comes out from around that corner, and she's about to go off, but then Harden's mom is like, Oh my god, you're Tessa! And Tessa realizes that it's Harden's mom. So basically, Harden tells Tessa that he didn't want to go to London without her, but he reluctantly did, only for his mom to be like, no, I want to meet Tessa, let's go back to the States. And Harden hasn't told his mom about the fact that they're, like, not together, or the dare or anything, but he also says that, like, she doesn't have to act like they're still together. But then Tessa's like, no, it's fine, I'll play along. Because Tessa is stupid. Sorry. I want to like her, and at a lot of times I do, but I'm so anti-Harden that Tessa can be very annoying with her awful decision making when it comes to Harden. Skipping the rest of that scene because it's just Tessa's mom and Har- Tessa's mom? No, nope. Harden's mom. And Tessa bonding, and then Tessa and Harden, shocker, have more sex. Tessa's going out of town to celebrate the holidays with her mom, and when she gets there, she's greeted by her ex Noah, and they have this really awkward conversation, and Noah alludes to something happening with Tessa's dad, and Tessa's like, what the fuck is happening with my dad? Also, why are you still talking to my mom, weirdo? That's weird. Noah gets a call from Tessa's mom on his phone, and Tessa answers and is like, why are you calling my ex? What's going on with my dad? You know, going off. Also, side note, I think they told Summer Blair that it was gonna be a FaceTime or something because she's like during that scene she's like holding the phone like this out in front of her face but it it wasn't to FaceTime. Anyways the big reveal is that Tessa's dad wanted to see her but Tessa's mom said no and Tessa is mad at her mom for not telling her so that that's it. Tessa just leaves and goes right back to Harden. Jesus Christ I'm getting tired of this movie and I'm not even an hour in. I guess I'll mention this now because this is the second time it's come up and the first time I didn't mention it just because I was like um but Harden has a randomly, incredibly fucked up backstory. Basically, Chancellor Scott, before he was Chancellor Scott, was like a really bad dude and he had a drinking problem and he owed a bunch of people money. And one night when Harden was like eight, some guys came to their house to collect the debt from his dad, but the dad wasn't home. So they, they are worded his mom. Yeah. Harden still has nightmares about that to this day, and he had one, like, when Tessa ran back to him that night after fighting with her mom. That's why I'm bringing it up now. 
fucking dark okay so it's the next morning tessa and hardin's mom are talking and they're opening up about what happened to his mom and how hardin had told her that the nightmare stopped when tessa came into his life no pressure there and tessa tells her that hardin lied to her but she doesn't specify the lie and then hardin wakes up and gives tessa another birthday gift which is just the perfect day treating her to whatever she wants to do cue the one montage per movie where they are actually enjoyable and cute as a couple and by the end of it they are officially back together and are a couple yay hey remember hardin's ridiculously fucked up backstory yeah it comes back up again at hardin's hardin's dad's christmas party where hardin punches his dad in the face because hardin's drunk and mad that his dad has moved on and even hardin's mom is like bruh stop it get some help i've moved on you're becoming severely unhealthy so naturally hardin goes home and trashes the apartment that he and tessa share while a safian stevens song plays the next day at work tessa vents about it to dylan sprouse who is may i remind you literally best boyfriend material anyway and there's clearly some unresolved and unspoken sparks of something between her and trevor but tessa is stupid and also trevor is moving to the new office in guess where Seattle. We're back to Seattle. Speaking of Seattle, in the next scene, Hardin and Tessa are in their apartment reading when Steph texts Hardin about a New Year's party happening at the frat house, and the two of them decide to go when Tessa gets a call from her boss offering her a position at the new office in Seattle, and he says that she can bring Hardin. She says she'll think about it, moving on, the party. Hardin is back to his shady shit imagine that he pulls this girl aside that he recognizes and asks to go talk to her upstairs and when he comes back down the stairs tessa is waiting at the bottom and he's like let's leave let's get out of here but bitch ass molly confronts them who i hate to say i love the outfit she's wearing it's very pretty she's pretty i don't hate that actress or anything her character is just evil anyway so she convinces them to stay and they play truth or dare a callback to the start of the plot of the first movie this is where we get the most iconic interaction of the entire series i don't even need to see the next movie or the fourth one that's coming later this year or the two other movies that are already in production this is the best line of the franchise molly truth or dare mm, truth is it true that you're a whore oh, oh shit, shit. What the fuck did you just call me? No, I didn't call you anything. I just I just asked you a question. Are you a whore? You are. You have to answer honestly because it's called truth for a reason. Is it true that you're a whore? Oh shit. The fuck did you just call me? Oh, I didn't call you anything. I just asked you a question. Are you a whore? You have to answer honestly. It's called truth for a reason. literally cinema babes that was literally cinema after that molly calls tessa a dumbass for getting back together with hardin and believing anything he says which to her credit isn't wrong but she's only saying that out of spite and is only a bitch to tessa out of jealousy so it's like not a valid thing for her specifically to say even if in that moment she's right tessa and molly get into a physical altercation it's comically bad and then tessa and hardin go up to some random person's room and fuck in it ew rude and then we are right back to the unhealthy relationship dynamic because as they do the do or sorry after they do the do tessa gets a text from trevor saying congrats about the seattle offer and instead of hardin just going hey what's that about he like storms out and then waiting at the bottom of the stairs is the girl from earlier and hardin asks her to keep something between the two of them and the girl says of course i never kiss and tell right as tessa is like walking down the stairs so she sees that and she thinks that something shady is going on she thinks that he's cheating on her and then as revenge she kisses some random dude and her and hardin get into this really loud really embarrassing fight in the front yard of the frat house and they break up again after being together for like maybe a week <laughs> okay are you ready for what happens next are you sure you're ready for what happens next so <laughs> it's the next day tessa wakes up and all of her messages to harden from the previous night didn't go through she gets up to go somewhere I, i'm not sure where i think either to work or like to go look for him i think to look for him harden slept over at the frat house he wakes up and his phone is dead the girl that said the thing about the kissing and telling is walking out of the frat house and harden's like hey do you have a charger and she's like there's one in her car tessa while driving is trying to call harden he's still not answering because his phone is dead out of frustration, she throws her phone into the floorboard of the passenger side of her car. Hardin is being driven home by the girl, and he finally charges his phone enough to turn it on and call Tessa back. 
Tessa hears her phone going off while she's at a red light. And since she's at a red light, she's not driving. She unbuckles to reach over to try and get the phone. But she still can't reach it because the light turns green and someone behind her starts to honk. So she stops trying to reach for it and she starts driving. And then she gets hit by an SUV. And Hardin and the girl happen to drive past the crash and see Tessa being taken away by an ambulance. <laughs> so Hardin is trying to find out what hospital Tessa's at and Landon says he won't tell him because it's his fault that she crashed. So Hardin is just, he's calling every hospital in the city and at the fifth hospital, it's the right one. And he gets transferred like to Tessa's phone number and guess who picks up the phone? Fucking Trevor. I think I like this movie now. The amount of messiness they packed into like the last 30 minutes of the movie is unironically so good. So Trevor tells Hardin that he isn't allowed to see her anymore and that he's toxic and bad for her and that if he really loves Tessa and wants her to be happy, he would leave her alone. When Tessa gets home from the hospital, she finds a note on her table left by Hardin saying how he loves her and that's why he's leaving and staying far away from her because even though they have their happy moments, they aren't good for each other. Fucking finally, they're realizeless. <laughs> he also explains that the girl from the New Year's Eve party is someone he had a thing with in the past that he did dirty because he's you know a piece of shit but he was trying to make amends with her because he's trying to be a better person for tessa he ends the note by saying that not being together is gonna suck for a while but eventually she'll be okay again and then he says a final goodbye before going away to london to be with his mom and try to quit his addiction to alcohol and also his addiction to tessa ladies and gentlemen and everyone else in the last 15 minutes of the second of three movies hardin scott has for the first time ever done something decent. But then his fucking mom fucks it up by convincing him to go back and win Tessa because he has to start fighting for what really matters. Bruh, let the dead dog die. Lie. What's that saying? Let the dead dog lie? So Tessa is at this work party that's celebrating the expansion into Seattle and she's talking to Trevor and she says that she thinks she actually is gonna go ahead and take the opportunity in Seattle and that makes Trevor happy since he's going too. And then he leaves for a sec. And while he's gone, in comes fucking Harden. And Tessa, of course, fucking leaves the party with him. So they run off and Harden gets a tattoo dedicated to Tessa because of course he does. And then they're walking the streets of Atlanta when this homeless guy comes up behind them and he starts calling out Tessa's name. I need y'all to sit down if you're not sitting because the scream I scrumped at this scene was insane. This homeless man is the homeless man from the beginning of the movie that Harden was an asshole to and is also Tessa's dad. And then the movie fucking ends. I was in shambles, babes, truly put in a chokehold and gagged. Are you kidding? I truly cannot remember a better plot twist in any movie. That came out of nowhere. What the- uh, Some recap before we get into the third movie, I guess. <laughs> After two is only an hour and 45 minutes long, and it took me, I'm not kidding, five hours to get through because of how many times I had to pause to write something down on top of just like the normal like bathroom and snack breaks. I think my brain- is melted and fried. I had to I had to step away. I tried to watch the second and third movie in the same day, but watching the second movie took so long that I was like, I can't. I had to I had to stop. I dyed my hair. I instead of watching it, I just dyed my hair. <sighs> anyway, um so yeah, I think my brain was melted and fried, but I also think that that was Netflix's goal because I also think that I am now a fully invested fan of the After Cinematic Universe great. I don't have much to say that I haven't already mentioned. I think the writing has improved a little bit, but that's also because they aren't really focusing on introducing the afterworld like they were in the first movie. I don't know much about like business fashion. I know they have different rules than casual fashion, so I can't say much in terms of the wardrobing of this movie since it is more business oriented. I'll say I really like the suits Dylan wears. He's got some nice blues throughout his wardrobe. That was cool. I think Tessa is still slightly behind in the fashion game, but it's less obvious and visually I think her growth is more clear, especially comparing the dress she wore to the frat party in the first movie versus the dress she wore to the New Year's party in this movie. There's like clearly differences. Um, final note,
notes. Still don't like Harden. I hope Dylan Sprouse is in the third movie. Okay. I, I'm ready to do this final stretch. We've got this. The third movie is called After We Fell, and it is the shortest out of the three with a runtime of one hour and 36 minutes, which is one hour and 36 minutes of my life. I'm never getting back. It starts with a flashback of Tessa as a child, revealing her mother, who isn't Selma Blair anymore. They recast her. You will be missed, queen. Um, she's kicking Tessa's dad out of the house because of his problems with alcohol, and it's assumed that this is the last time Tessa... Tessa... Tessa actually saw her dad. Flashback ended. Tessa's dad is now having dinner with her and Harden. This like picks up right after, after two. Harden's being a dick. Shocking, I know. He even tries to bribe Tessa's dad with money to leave. And her dad's like, no, I'm here to like build a relationship with my daughter. The irony of his behavior is purposeful, I'm pretty sure, because Harden claims his reasoning for acting this way is because he's afraid of Tessa getting hurt and that his dad isn't trustworthy, which is very rich coming from Harden. So I'm pretty sure that this is an intentional parallel of Harden and Tessa's dad, but yeah, doesn't make him any less annoying. Anyways, we find out that Tessa is for sure going to Seattle, and she's leaving in a week and didn't tell Harden. She wants Harden to come with her, but Harden says he wanted the two of them to move to London after graduation. This is a stupid argument <laughs> as to why they can't go to Seattle, because at this point, Tessa's like still a freshman and Harden's a sophomore. They both have years until graduation. They could totally be in Seattle until then. We're literally barely seven minutes into the movie and this is like their second argument, but it's not even like the fun messiness of the second movie. It's just Harden being fucking annoying because stuff isn't going his way. He says that Tessa already has a plan in life and that doesn't include him. And Tessa's like, literally, what are you talking about? I'm asking you to come with me. I want you to come with me. And also this entire time, you've never said anything about moving to London. There's no resolution to that conflict because Tessa goes to class. And guess what? I'm confused about the location of this movie again. There's an establishing shot that looks like Washington, and it's shown when Hardin is dropping Tessa's dad off at some bar that has a painting outside of it that's like a landscape with a group of moose, which is like Washington, still Washington scenery. Yet again implying that we are in Washington. But the school that all the characters go to is called Rossmore University of Atlanta. Now this is not a real school, but it has Atlanta in the name, and the actual school that they filmed at in place of Rossmore is a private university in Atlanta, and the entire first and second movies are filmed in Atlanta. It is heavily implied that this movie takes place in Georgia. There's no Atlanta, Washington. There are only three cities called Atlanta in the United States. Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta, Texas, and Atlanta, Michigan. If they wanted them to go to school in Washington, but couldn't use a real school. Literally, they could have just switched Atlanta with any real city in Washington. This is going to haunt me forever. Are we in Washington or not, Netflix? <sighs> Anyways, Hardin and Tessa's dad decide to get drunk together despite them not liking each other. And then they get into a bar fight. The writers must have been grasping at straws at this point because the degradation of quality of plot since the first movie to now is starting to get incredibly noticeable. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just gonna read this directly. After Tessa brings them home from the bar, Tessa and Harden try ice play. That's it. <laughs> I just wrote, I wrote that and then put, yeah, anyways. Because quite literally, yeah, anyways. The next day, they're back to arguing about Seattle. It's established that Harden is refusing to go to Seattle with Tessa, despite knowing that this is an incredible opportunity for Tessa and it's her dream job, and he's also trying to convince her to stay with him in Atlanta or Washington or wherever the fuck they are. He's just such a Prince Charming, isn't he? I feel like I'm getting more and more bitter every time I talk about Harden, but I can't help it. He sucks so much. Cherry on top of the Harden sucks Sunday. The next day while Tessa is at work, Kimberly tells her that Vance literally offered Harden a job in Seattle so he could move with Tessa and kind of have his own thing and his own income and another reason to go with her. And Harden refused and didn't tell Tessa anything about that. Side note, Kimberly and Vance have also been recast, and so has Landon. Not that I'm complaining, though, because now Chance Perdomo plays Landon, and I do, in fact, have a big fat crush on Chance Perdomo. Harden's family, meaning his dad, stepmom, and Landon, are going to their lake house for the weekend, and Tessa and Harden join them. There's this scene where they're on a boat on the lake, and Tessa and Harden are having this moment where they talk yet again about Seattle and their future, and then they quote Jane Austen back and forth to each other, 
It would be a fine scene if this was literally any other couple in any other movie, but it's not. It's Tessa and Harden, a couple that we as the viewer know should not be together because they're awful for each other. So we aren't going to feel anything at this scene that's supposed to be like an emotional turning point. You know, it's supposed to be them being like, we don't know the future, but we know that we're in love and we're supposed to feel for them. But oh my God, just break up already. At this point, the only thing keeping them together is sex. Anytime they have an argument, it's literally never resolved. They just have sex and put the argument on the back burner until the next time the topic comes up into conversation and then another argument ensues and then they have sex again and nothing has ever been resolved because Tessa and Harden have never had a healthy communication ever literally ever. Tessa now has less than a week before she moves to Seattle and we still don't know if Harden's going with her despite the two of them talking about it like four or five times now. It's genuinely exhausting. Like I don't, I don't at this point I didn't even want to keep watching the movie. Tessa and Harden argue again about Seattle again. Shocking. And Harden decides to bring up the fact that he's the reason that Tessa has the job and the moving opportunity because his dad owns the company I'm pretty sure. Okay, so technically I wasn't wrong when I said that his dad owned the company, but that's not because Hardin's dad, Chancellor Scott, owns Vance Publishing. It's because Hardin Scott's dad is actually Christian Vance? I'm not sure if that's just a plot twist or a continuity error because I only found that info out when I was looking at the after wiki because I couldn't remember how Hardin was connected to Vance, but... Yeah, Harden is Vance's son. Anyways, that little piece of knowledge Harden said was only brought up to make Tessa feel less than, which is a super great thing to do to your girlfriend, but it also makes him not wanting her to move even dumber. If you went out of your way to get her the opportunity like you claim to have done, why are you now stopping her from pursuing them? Example number 437 of why Harden Scott sucks fucking ass and I hate him. After this argument, Tessa decides to leave for Seattle earlier than she was supposed to. She goes right after her and Harden get home from the lake house and she doesn't tell him. Good. Thank God. Stay away from him. She goes to stay with her bosses, Christian Vance and Kimberly, until she can find her own apartment in Seattle. And she's transferred to a new university. We don't know the name of it. Uh, but she's still thinking of Harden. She's checking her phone to see if he's tried to contact her. She keeps stopping herself from texting him. Baby, please just block his number. I'm begging you. She actually does end up calling him. And this is like the first time, I think in the entire set of movies, that they have an emotionally mature conversation. They talk about Seattle. Harden says he wants her to be happy because she deserves it. And for the first time he's saying this, it's not in a manipulative manner. Um, and it turns out he's taking like boxing classes and finding a better outlet for his anger issues. They both seem better off and happier at the end of the conversation. And honestly, I wish that the second movie was longer and that they brought this into the last movie, the second movie. Like everything from this movie up until this point, they just had it as the end of the second movie. Like, like just make it two movies of an emotionally manipulative and abusive relationship instead of three, soon to be four, or soon to be six, you know? Have the end of the second movie be them like being separated and also being happy about it. Obviously that's not what happened um, because why would it? <laughs> why would it be? Anyways, we're only halfway through the movie at this point, so I genuinely don't know where this is gonna go. Let's find out. Oh, they just remain in contact with each other. <laughs> they just keep talking. I feel like I need a drink, bro. They have phone sex after Tessa's first day at the Seattle branch of Vance Publishing. It's awkward. They both like are, it's really zoomed in on their mouths. It's weird. Uh, and then they just keep talking on the phone again and again and again. And eventually Harden goes to Seattle to surprise Tessa. Harden is immediately back on his bullshit and he's being really cold to Tessa for no reason because he keeps thinking back to this nightmare he had where he, Tessa got with the waiter of a restaurant that they went to when the family was at the lake house. I want to bash my skull in. Also, now I'm confused about Harden's age because over dinner, Harden and Christian talk about graduation. And at this point, that's like the third time it's been brought up that Harden is graduating. But as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't make sense because we know for a fact that Harden is one year older than Tessa and there's no way that Harden is graduating that early. Was there some unmentioned time skip and Harden's actually a senior? No, because the only time skip we've seen in the movie is that one month after after one, after, after, that's funny, after, after one at the start of after two and after three picks up right at the end of after two. So there's no other time skips. 
and now I need to change my camera battery because I've been recording for that long. Yet another mystery in terms of the time and location of the after cinematic universe. Let's just, let's just move on. Tessa confronts Harden and is like, hey, why are you being weird? And Harden tells Tessa about the nightmare about her and the waiter, Roberts. This ends with them having sex. The only reason I'm bringing that up is because they don't use protection, which comes back up later on. The next morning, Harden excuses himself to take a phone call from his mom, and Kimberly's like, oh, I wonder if it's about the wedding. Yes, Harden's mom is getting remarried. Good for her, but Tessa is for some reason bothered by Harden not telling her about it even though they're like not even really technically together. She starts this argument when Hardin's getting ready to leave Seattle and she's like, what happened to not keeping secrets from each other? And this is the only time I will ever be on Hardin's side because who the fuck cares? He's not like actually keeping a secret from her and it's not even anything that pertains to their relationship. He didn't tell her because he isn't even planning on going. To be fair, this is resolved pretty quickly though. Hardin just says that he's thinking about it and if he does decide to go, he's going to take Tessa. Great. Problem solved. Harden goes back home. When he gets home, he finds his apartment door to be cracked open, and inside the apartment, he finds Tessa's dad, who is beaten up because he owes some guy $500, and it's revealed that Tessa's dad really hasn't changed at all. Harden gives him a watch to sell for the money, and that's like it. And then it jumps to Tessa trying to get birth control so she and Harden can keep having unprotected sex, but the doctor tells her that she might not need it because there's a chance she won't ever be able to get pregnant because of some unspecified issue with her cervix. Those two scenes being back to back is really weird, and it's also weird that they left both scenes unresolved. It was like, oh, by the way, Tessa's dad. Oh, by the way, Tessa might not be able to get pregnant. Um, anyways, Vance Publishing is having a party. Let's go there. <laughs> like, Okay. At the party, Harden reveals that in two months, he's going to move to Seattle to be with Tessa. Yay. Skipping forward a little bit, Tessa and Harden do end up going to London for his mom's wedding. Okay. Oh shit. <laughs> We're literally like 10 minutes away from the movie ending and something interesting has finally happened. Harden wakes up in the middle of the night and he goes downstairs to change the thermostat or something when he hears crashing downstairs and a man and a woman grunting. And it's kind of like a callback to his nightmare of the incident from his childhood where he saw those men or word his mom. But he goes downstairs and finds his mom having sex with not her fiance, Day, but Christian Vance. Cheaters. We got some fucking cheaters. An argument ensues because Harden's mom is getting married the next morning and she's cheating with Vance, who is married and his wife, Kimberly, is pregnant. So... You guys suck. Everyone sucks in this movie. The argument continues and escalates to where Harden and Vance actually start punching each other and um, Tessa and fuck was Harden's mom's name? I don't know. Harden's mom separate them. Tessa's like, let's go. And they go back upstairs. The next day, Harden's mom still gets married. And as they're all walking out after the ceremony, uh, Vance tells Harden to go meet him at the bar in a hotel for them to have a conversation. I kind of already accidentally spoiled it, but yeah, the reveal is that Vance is actually Harden's dad. So Harden's parents know Christian Vance because he was a family friend and Harden and his mom actually lived with Christian back when Harden's mom and Chancellor Scott were separating. And it just, it turns out that his mom and Christian were more than just friends the whole time. And then the movie ends with a to be continued screen. That was after we fell the third movie. Um, that movie sucked fucking ass. And I was genuinely annoyed at how many hours I had spent working on this video because of how that movie ended. That movie was garbage. Not that the first two were great or anything, but you bet your goddamn ass that they were better than that dumpster fire of a movie. I'm still, I'm still upset. <laughs> I don't even know how to end this video. I have nothing insightful or analytical to say about After 3. That movie sucked. After 2 was the best one, I'll say that, but even at its best, it's part of a saga of movies based off of a Harry Styles smutty fan fiction, and the movies honestly romanticize emotionally abusive relationships. So, and to be honest, it's a bit alarming. Like when I was finding clips to use for this video, I found a lot of accounts that were actively in support of Harden and Tessa's relationship. They were making like song edits and shipping them. And it's just kind of sad. I am assuming that those people are tween girls that can't tell that this type of relationship isn't healthy and is incredibly toxic. And I, I don't know. I, I don't really feel good about the impression that these movies leave on that younger demographic. I know not to be like annoying or chronically online or overly sensitive, whatever, but like going through that kind of relationship fucking sucks.
speaking from experience. And I do think that that's part of why I'm pretty harsh on these movies, other than, like, quality-wise, they are bad, but it's... I don't know. I feel kind of icky. <laughs> That's all I have to say. I'll probably revisit this when the fourth movie comes out. Um, I am curious about the fifth and sixth movies too that have already been confirmed, but it's also been confirmed that Josephine Langford and Hero, Hero Tiffin, who play Tessa and Hardin, are not going to be in them. So... I don't know, maybe I'll talk about those two. In the meantime, if you have movies or a series or a saga you want me to talk about, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. But yes, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, like the video. Please like the video. Please like the video. I spent um, way too many hours of my life on this, and I'm not getting those back. But, it, it's, but I can get some likes out of this. So if you liked the video, like the video. If you liked the video, comment on the video. And if you liked the video, subscribe to The Video Maker. And I'll see you in the next video or on my Patreon or on my socials or on my second channel. Okay, bye. <laughs> I'm, I need to nap. I'm so tired.